Sometime in the latter half of the 22nd century, there was a devastatingly brutal world war. One that sent humanity back to the technological dark age and very nearly drove them to extinction. But after a few hundred years, once their population had risen, and they had not only met, but actually surpassed their initial degree of technological prowess, they formed an international committee called the Human Star Foundation. The HSF had one goal, to ensure the human race would never again fall so dangerously toward extinction. In order to achieve this, they would begin to colonize and terraform the other planets in their solar system, with the hopes of someday colonizing outside of their system as well. That way, the human race could never be entirely wiped out from a single dispute or ecological disaster. In short, you can basically think of them as a precursor to the terraforming guild, which was mentioned in the previous videos. Anyway, as I'm sure you could have guessed, Mars would shortly be the first planet terraformed by the HSF. But it wasn't too long after that work would begin on the topic of this video, the Terra. By the time of our story, most of the relatively large celestial bodies in the solar system have been terraformed to some degree, and that includes the moon. It has been entrenched with a deep, lunar-spanning ocean that has left a single supercontinent and a handful of small islands above the rising tide. It has also been given an entire ecosystem of genetically modified life, perfectly adapted for their lunar habitat. However, since the moon is still so small and has such a weak gravitational pull, its atmosphere is relatively thin which means that even now it is significantly colder and can hold significantly less oxygen than the other planets. This simple fact has led to several different environments for the lunar population to inhabit. Most of the middle and lower class live in subterranean cities made from hollowed out lava tubes hidden beneath the surface. And while there is no shortage of classy, well-kept neighborhoods inside of these underground towns, there are a lot more that are dark, damp, and overcrowded. But either way, they still have plenty of imported oxygen and are kept at a comfortable temperature. Directly above these rabbit holes and resting on the lunar surface are giant glass bubbles, each of which can basically be thought of as a greenhouse city, where the upper class are allowed to live in perfect luxury, whining and dining inside of their magnificent mansions surrounded on every side by green gardens, exotic creatures, and a clear view of the beautiful night sky. Outside of the bubble, we'll find miles of mostly untouched wilderness. Snow-covered tundra, desolate shrubland, and cold desert. But every now and again, you'll also find a cozy little ranch, where a family of working-class farmers are roughing it out on the tundra in order to raise their livestock. And with that, I would be remiss if I didn't mention something. With the level of genetic technology these future humans are clearly capable of, why would they still have farmers? Like, why wouldn't they just grow their meat and other animal products inside of a lab? Well, the honest answer is that homesteading astronauts raising genetically modified animals on the lunar surface is way cooler than a bunch of pencil-pushing scientists growing a package of bacon inside of a test tube. But if you want an actual answer, I guess they probably learned their lesson of being too reliant on technology after the aforementioned World War that sent everyone back to the Dark Age. So that's why they still have regular farmers, people that would know what to do if the grid were to ever go down again. And I imagine these farmers are probably subsidized by the government in order to make their farm-raised meat more affordable than the lab-grown stuff. Now I have actually designed a bunch of different creatures to fill out the lunar ecosystem, way more than I could ever mention in a video like this. So for right now, I will focus on a single facet of this alien biosphere, that being the lunar mammoth. Before that big, scary war that I keep going on and on about, a couple of scientists were actually successful in resurrecting the mammoth, the mastodon, and a few of the other extinct species that humans have been trying to resurrect for years now. And since they mostly live in sparsely populated parts of the globe, they were all but entirely unaffected by the war. Later on, as the human race began to stretch into the surrounding planets and beyond, some of them decided to bring the mammoths with them. Meaning that along with the genetically modified and alien creatures that we will slowly be introduced to as this series continues, there will also be herds of extant mammoths on the lunar surface. One last thing that I wanted to mention is the cultural significance that the moon holds on the entire rest of the solar system, since it basically acts as a trading hub between Earth and the other planets. And just as Buddhism was greatly spread by the Silk Road, the customs and beliefs endemic to the moon have likewise been pushed across the rest of the solar system. 
One such belief is that of the Orlando Lunar Catholic, an incredibly strange offshoot of modern Christianity that has imbued the original 1969 moon landing with a great deal of spiritual importance. Within this belief, Neil Armstrong has been reimagined as a patron saint, and his original touchdown point, now swallowed by the surrounding ocean, has been transformed into a sacred shrine that millions of people flock to every year. So, as most of you already know, this video is just a small part of my larger biopunk project, the next episode of which will be released tomorrow. It's another short story, and it takes place in the snow-clad tundras of the lunar surface. Here we find a humble mammoth farmer trapped within an uneasy standoff with a biotech cyborg of uncertain origins. And on the day that follows, we'll have another world-building video on the lore implications of that aforementioned cyborg. Anyway, I know this is kind of a step back from the previous video, which took place on a distant alien world in the far, far future, but I thought it would be a good idea to start off a little bit closer to home and then gradually work back to that crazy, far-flung sci-fi stuff. So it'll probably be another few months before we leave the solar system again, just because these videos take a really long time to produce. But if you would like to support me and help make these videos come out a little bit faster, then you can subscribe to my Patreon for as little as $1 a month. There, you'll have early access to all of my videos, as well as a bunch of entirely exclusive content, such as the Interstellar Gardens Bestiary, where you can read not only about the creatures of this universe themselves, but also the effect they've had on the local population. For example, there's the Spearpoint Bat, and how it's begun to make a habit of building little nests inside of the fur of domesticated mammoths, and how the local farmers not only allow the bat to do this, but even go out of their way to invite them by painting the mammoth's tusks with bioluminescent paint, since they believe the Spearpoint Bat to be good luck for winter. I've already released three documents, and that number is only going to grow as I continue to work on the Martian ecosystem as well. So if you'd like an early glimpse on my vision of a terraform Mars, then that's where you can find it. With that being said, I would like to take a second to thank all of my current patrons, including Lord Frostrake and the Deranged, Justin Chinkalpet, MTL, Edgy Electrokinetic, Alex, Toothy Jones, and JJ Walker. I would also like to briefly mention the countless people that have continued to help me with my worldbuilding projects over on my Discord server. I haven't asked too much from them on this particular video, but they have certainly helped me with a bunch of other stuff and are currently helping me as I design a group of biomechanical machine gun dogs that will eventually make its way into a future video. Also, I'm sorry if my voice sounds a little different than usual. I am dreadfully sick at the time of recording. Anyway, I hope you guys will stick around for the upcoming videos, and until next time, don't die. I'll see you later.